So uh, we're so excited today to have Whitney Robinson present her work. Whitney Robinson is an epidemiologist who specializes in quantitative methodology for studying health inequalities. She's a faculty epidemiologist at the Duke University School of Medicine in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology's Division of Women's Community and Population Health. Um, Dr. Robinson currently leads an NIH R01 that uses healthcare and administrative data to understand causes of racial ethnic disparities in treatment of conditions like fibroids, abnormal uterine bleeding, and endometriosis in the premenopausal period. Uh, the central motivation of Dr. Robinson's research is showing how social and environmental factors underpin race and sex differences in health even for inequalities sometimes presumed to be mostly biologically based, such as racial disparities, uh, racial differences in uh, cancer incidence or rates of hysterectomy. A common theoretical underpinning of her work is the life course framework, particularly hypotheses that exposures during critical periods in utero, during childhood and at other life stages, such as the menopausal tradition have enduring effects on later adult health. I think Whitney Robinson is a leader in the population health field, and we're so um, lucky to have her today. Thank you, Whitney. So um, please take it away. Thank you. Thank you for the warm introduction, and I'm really glad to be here with you all virtually. Um, if there's any trouble with audio or any other issues you have understanding me, feel, please feel free to add it um, to the chat so I can correct any issues. So the talk today that I'm giving can seem very based in medicine and healthcare delivery, which is not usually the focus of a population center. Uh, but I am trained as a social epidemiologist, and I was a member of the Carolina Population Center um, for about a decade before I moved to Duke. So I really do have this grounding in a population framework. And I hope that you will hang with me talking about all the medicine stuff, because one, I think it's just interesting to us as human beings who um, care about equity and access access. Um, and two, I think that some of the issues that are coming up actually do have some salience for uh, population health and that they get at kind of critical issues about how we think about prediction and causation and equity and quantitative data. So hopefully we'll end up having a lively discussion and you can tell me whether you think any of this is relevant to your work. Um, and so I'm gonna hit on two key themes, I think, in this talk. It's mostly gonna center around the idea of algorithmic bias in medicine and how we improve this science. And I'm gonna make an argument that sampling, the way we frame research, and the way we measure health status are all critical in having a data science that is more equitable in medicine. And then if we have time, um, I might also get into this tension between prediction and causation. In medicine, there's a lot of data being used, um, maybe in ways that aren't representative samples or where the research question maybe doesn't fit the data right. And people can say, well, we're just trying to do prediction and we have a lot of numbers and we can do prediction in our data um, and we are not necessarily informed by causal thinking. And so one of the things I've been thinking about is how much predictive models need to be informed by causal thinking. And I've made that argument um, in a 2020 epidemiology article that I think causal thinking is important. Um, and then also thinking about whether causal thinking needs to incorporate more precise prediction um, you know, and the ways in which we form groups for study. Are we bring, being precise enough about how we pick those groups and stratify the groups we think of as high risk or low risk? So um, we'll see if we get to all of it. So my first awareness of even the idea of algorithmic bias was actually with a hand dryer. I am a person in my early 40s and I am probably aging myself, but I remember as a kid, our only option for drying our hands after we washed them were paper towels. And then suddenly there were these hand dryers. And I remember when they first came out and I would use them and sometimes they just didn't work. Like I'd be trying to make the hand dryer work and nothing would happen. <laughs> You know, and I would kind of have to fiddle with them and then sometimes they would work. And then only later did I realize, after other people realized, that a lot of these hand dryers had been programmed 
for light reflectivity. So they worked really well on pale skin. So it, it was kind of a, a motion detection thing that relied on a reflectivity with pale skin. And they just didn't work with people who had darker skinned hands because of the assumption that the light reflectivity was a good marker of someone putting their hands there to be dried. And so it has been fixed. It was a very fixable problem, but it did make me think about the ways in which our assumptions about the populations that we do the tests on to build the tools can shape whether they work. And even when they were testing it, maybe they did have a few people who had darker skin and it didn't work, but maybe there was a small population, the error rate seemed low. And so also the question of when our model is not quite working on everybody, how curious are we? At what point do we decide there's a problem that we need to push on versus something being within the tolerance of error of any kind of tool we're making? And then often thinking about what you're optimizing for. So I start out with this kind of basic engineering example because I think it's easy to kind of get your hands around, uh, but there's been a lot more work in people using scientific formulas. And I think a lot of the issues are the same. And so Ziad Obermeyer, who's the lead author in this paper, is actually doing a lot of really cool work in this space. And I'm going to reference another paper he's on later. And so you all might have heard about this. Um, a lot of health systems are rich in data. They have all this data flowing through for insurance purposes and, um, and the electronic healthcare record. And a lot of times health systems will give their data two commercial private entities that then repackage the data to then sell health systems back tools for trying to improve something, a variety of things. And so there's this widely um, used algorithm um, that this private company is selling to a lot of health systems that says, we're gonna help you target patients who are at highest risk for um, sickness to be able to intervene on them early to prevent their uncontrolled illness. So it's kind of a risk stratification tool to identify the people based on patterns in their data who are at higher risk. And so Ziad Obermeyer's group kind of did an audit of this tool and said, this tool is not working well and the ways in which it's working badly is in a racially biased way. So on this slide, you'll see them um, take the tool but instead of using the proprietary algorithm, um, they themselves just kind of use the data to see who would have uncontrolled hypertension a year later, who would have uncontrolled you know, high diabetes, who would have renal failure, who would have bad cholesterol. And they compared the actual data on who was having these bad outcomes to what the model had predicted as far as the people who would be at higher risk. Um, and so in purple, on each graph is our black populations, and I think non-Hispanic black populations in the data and white populations, and they simplify to these two groups. And you can see that the model um, at any given percentile of this risk algorithm score. So um, my um, the black patients, had higher risk at the same level of the algorithm risk score. So, you know, you're thinking about this as a way to intervene on people early who are at higher risk. And for, you know, the hypertension or diabetes and a little bit um, the renal failure, the black patients have to be sicker to be eligible for this intervention, which is not what you would want. You don't want this tool to identify people who are eligible for more intervention and help to, have a difference where black patients have to be sicker to get the help. And so what he discovered was that the algorithm had been using healthcare expenditure as the marker of who was the sickest. And in a very profit driven healthcare system like the US that could be reasonable, the sicker people maybe would use the most healthcare expenditure but what they hadn't thought about was that because of the way our healthcare system works, on general black and white patients who are similarly sick, the white patients get more care for a lot of reasons in the US healthcare system. And so if you ignore that and you assume that healthcare spending is a neutral 
accurate proxy for sickness, you're going to get a system like this that replicates the inequity in the system where Black patients get less care at the same level of sickness um, that's going to then require Black patients to be sicker before you would intervene on them. And so, you know, what the Obermeyer group did was they actually looked at the actual real health outcome instead of using healthcare spending as a proxy. And healthcare spending is something that's extremely accessible and quantifiable and was easy for these people to get their hands on, but it was the wrong outcome. And so this will come up a little bit. And I just want to note, Whitney, I'm sorry to interrupt this, is Teresa, that this article was in Science. And so this is, you know, one of the leading interdisciplinary journals uh, in science. So that's why yeah. this is extremely impactful. Yes. Got a lot of press and is really making people think more about, oh, like, even if my model seems good. And uh, yes, it has all kinds of implications. So I would love to talk more about that. So... I think if you're somebody who's in machine learning and data science and in trying to do predictive, predictive models, um, how you deal with race is an interesting question. In the US, racial categories are very predictive. And even if you're not using them, things that correlate with racial categories are going to be very predictive. Um, racial categories in our society are potent marker of social hierarchy, especially the Black-white dynamic and society's resource allocation. And if you just ignore that, it's still going to be in your data because it influences almost everything that's going to be higher, high, highly predictive and give your data power. Um, and so some people might say, it's fine if my model seems to overall be doing well, but I argue that I think without a deep understanding of this, you know, you are going to be getting some error and it's probably going to be systematic error. And I think when all of us do data, it's useful to think for our algorithms, for our assumptions, for our predictions, if we had an audit like Obermeyer, if we had a smart person to come in and take a critical eye to the assumptions we're making, like how would our work fare? Um, and so I think, you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir here before a lot of people who are very data-driven and haven't thought theoretically about social hierarchies, they might even see this pattern. They might say, well, I read science. I've seen this Obermeyer work. And they'll hear anecdotes like about Google images, um, not recognizing Black faces. And so there's enough anecdata data out there that, you know, people would say, well, yes, you know, I, I see that there are these little problems, but one view is these could just be coincidences. You know, sometimes there's poor performance, but I would say the idea that these coincidences, the fact that this poor performance keeps clustering in certain groups, um, says that there's a larger problem that needs to be addressed. I'm really influenced by the public health critical race praxis, which is a framework um, in public health that's influenced by critical race theory that um, Chandra Ford first wrote about around 2010. I think this is a really um, nice paper and framework that gets into kind of four boxes of thinking about kind of the research team, how do you generate research ideas, how we think about measurement, and then how we think about implementation. And so one of the key tenets of the public health critical race praxis is the idea that, you know, there is structural racism, that there are all these ways in which society fosters discrimination via mutually reinforcing inequitable systems that span a lot of domains. And it's just kind of in the system, it's ordinary, it's common. And if you believe this, when you see all these coincidences of machine learning performing badly in certain populations, you have a different lens to say, oh, maybe there's actually some common problems and there can be common solutions. And this is not just a series of coincidences. So back to the public health critical race praxis, this is a figure um, from one of their seminal papers that talks about the idea that, you know, you're kind of conscious of race racism as a force for stratification in society and allocation of resources and power. Um, so focus one is just kind of believing that. And so then when you're evaluating why do these models keep performing badly in Black Americans, one of your hypotheses is going to be about structural racism versus 
that not even being on your radar. Um, Ford and her colleagues also talk about knowledge production, that the way we come up with ideas, um, the it, how we interrogate ideas, what is the threshold for believing something, who are the people doing the research is also very important. Um, then conceptualization and measurement, and then moving to action. So it's just a paper I recommend. And I think having that framework is helpful for how to interpret patterns like this when you see them and how to push forward. Um, so I'm just gonna keep moving on this one. And so I'm kind of making this argument that, you know, in health, this idea of algorithmic bias, where we're kind of seeing all of these repeated patterns of these models not functioning well or having kind of disparate function. Um, ignoring structural racism just keeps you perpetuating the same kind of problems. And I think one problem is just you still have this residual error here. Um, your model could be better if you thought more deeply about what you're trying to target and what are all the ways in which you might not be optimizing for what you wanna optimize for. And then I think ignoring structural racism is also a threat to transportability. So maybe I say, oh, I just wanna predict something in my population, but you know, that's a parlor trick. Often what we're trying to do is predict something for the same population five years in the future or being able to make a tool that will apply to other populations, or maybe our population is changing. So we think about that as transportability in epidemiology. And I think that you can't have transportability without understanding how structural racism might be functioning in your data. Um, and I think also ignoring structural racism actively exacerbates injustice and, and racism, you know, in the same way that healthcare spending was racially patterned if you have an algorithm that then builds on these data, the you know targeting for prevention is also going to be racially inequitable in the same way. And so uh, what I'm doing, what a lot of people are doing, what the Ziad Obermeyer group is doing, are really trying to think about better ways to do science. One that acknowledges that power dynamics influence knowledge production, influence what questions get asked, what models get built, how we sample, how we measure, and how we conceptualize problems. Um, and so kind of going back to the hand dryer, I think that particular example illustrates a few things that I think are important as we think about algorithmic bias in medicine. One is sampling and population health people think a lot about sampling. Um, and I think that's something that we can bring to medicine and many other domains that tend to think that people are kind of interchangeable. Um, I think the hand dryer says, examples is who you are testing something on makes a difference. If you're just testing on people with pale skin, you might think that your tool works great, but then when you put it out into the wild, there's errors just because you really didn't do a lot of good sampling on who you were testing on. I'm a big proponent of representative sampling, maybe more than other people. I don't think every study needs to be representatively sampled, but I think you always need to be thinking in your mind about your sampling. And then the way we frame research, and this is gonna come up with my next example as well. And so I think often if we see a problem with a model we've run, or if we see a problem with a program we're implementing, as researchers, we have to come up with some theories about what could be wrong in order to come up with solutions. And I think in this case, with the hand dryer, are we gonna attribute the issues that we might see to user error, which I think we often do. We think, well, people are just not using our, our tool right. <laughs> or like maybe people answer the questions wrong or something. Or do we interrogate ourselves and maybe say it's a machine error issue? Um, and I think this is kind of really important to us when we bring a critical eye to our research. And then as far as measuring health status, um, I was talking to some of the pop center leadership and um, saying that, you know, in my experience, being an epidemiologist at a pop center, the sociologist would be like, oh, you have no theory. Like, you're just like putting numbers into a machine and watching what comes out. Um, and they're like, you know, sometimes I would do some good research and they'd be like, oh, you actually do have some theory. And 
I would be like, thank you very much. But I think on our end as epidemiologists, often when we're working with sociologists or people who don't necessarily come from a health field, but they're doing health work, sometimes we feel like they're not specific enough about the measure of health status and critical enough about the measure of health status they're using. And so it might seem like, oh, well, BMI is as good as this adiposity measure, or maybe even the healthcare spending is just as good as the healthcare outcome. And, you know, if as long as it's a pretty good proxy for the health status, it's fine. Um, and I think that we can um, push that in our work and at least try to think about the ways in which a commonly used health measure actually might be reinforcing and reifying some bias in the system. And just to always keep in mind that just because something is commonly used as a health measure does not mean that it is the best to be used and that there could still be bias that's coming along um, with the tool. Um, so I talked about the Ziad Obermeyer paper on um, predicting, like risk prediction, predicting who is most in need of an intervention um, because they have poor health. Um, and there's another article, this one from Nature Medicine, where Emma Pearson is the first author and Ziad Obermeyer is the um, senior author that I love. Um, and so this paper is about a common problem in medicine where people have joint pain. Um, one of the common ways to understand people's joint pain is that it could be because of degenerative arthritis. And so we have a lot of imaging techniques to be able to look at the bones, to look at the cartilage. And there are some algorithms for deciding who has the most advanced arthritis, which we expect to be associated with more severe pain. But the problem is that doesn't always work. Sometimes people are in pain, there's imaging, and the image says they're fine, but they're in pain. So there is a disconnect. People know there's a disconnect. And there's also a known racial difference in this disconnect that Black patients in the U.S. specifically are more likely to present with knee pain, and the image says there's nothing wrong with them. And there's a whole line of research that is trying to say, well, Maybe this is because they are more stressed. Uh, maybe, you know, a lot of explanations basically about why Black people are either misattributing their pain or why there are psychosocial factors amplifying their pain above and beyond what is physiological with the idea that what shows up on the image is an accurate physiologic measure of pain. And so... You know, on this previous slide, we talked about sampling, framing, measurement. And this paper brings together all those things. So I think the Ziad Obermeyer group said, this whole idea that we have about what images correspond to what pain, where is that from? And so there's another paper they did where they're like, a lot of these initial kind of descriptions of what image goes to what pain came from some random cohort of UK coal miners in the 1950s. And there's so much of medicine that's like that. Like there's some tool that everybody's using and you dig deeper and deeper into figuring out where it came from. And it came from some very, very niche population, convenience population of people that aren't really representative of the people on which this is now being applied. And also this idea of framing. So we see that these measures really are not correlating well or as well with pain in Black populations. Do you say, what's wrong with Black populations? That their pain is not going with what we predict. It's kind of a user error frame. Or you could frame the research as, what's wrong with our tool that it's not working well in Black populations? And then finally, what is the outcome measure we're using? Um, when we build these algorithms? Are we just saying we're going to keep using the traditional gold standard of an x-ray? Or are we going to say the gold standard should actually be a person's experience of their body and function? And so those three things are all a critical lens that Pearson et al. brought to this problem. First, by saying, let's actually do a study where we ask people about their pain longitudinally. We also take the x-rays longitudinally and score those, but let's do it on a diverse population. I'm oh, sorry, I think I raised my hand. 
which I did not mean to do. Let me lower my hand. Okay. Um, so let's actually do a representative population, you know, the kind of population whom we're applying these measures. And then let's frame it in terms of the possibility that maybe um, the x-rays and the way we read the x-rays um, are not picking up on the pain. Let's assume also third that the pain is real and the thing that we want to predict for. Um, and so I don't think I have any beautiful images to share here, but what they did by trying to create an algorithm from the x-rays, they took the same x-rays, but usually there's like an algorithm about how people are supposed to read the x-rays. And they said, let's start with the pain and see if we can come up with a new algorithm for the features in the x-rays that predict pain. And they were able to come up with a new algorithm from the same images that better predicted everybody's pain and reduced the racial gap by like more than half. Um, and it also increased results for lower income people in general, for less educated people in general. And so their conclusion is, this suggests that much of underserved patients' pain stems from factors within the knee, physiologic factors that can be defected, detected, but that were not reflected in standard radiographic measures of severity. We show that the algorithm's ability to reduce unexplained disparities is rooted in the racial and socioeconomic diversity of the training set sampling. Because algorithmic severity measures better capture underserved patients' pain and severity measures influence treatment decisions, algorithmic predictions could potentially redress disparities in access to treatments like arthroplasty. Because people are making treatment decisions based on their reading using these algorithms that they traditionally have used. And so I really love this Pearson paper because they're bringing this critical eye. They're saying, let's use a more diverse sample for our training data sampling. Let's actually frame our question differently. Let's ask what's wrong with this tool instead of asking what's wrong with these patients. And then measurement. They're really optimizing the algorithm and the decision tool for patient ascertainment of pain versus this just accepting this commonly used medical classification tool. And the effect, this is still preliminary. They're having to go and try to replicate it, but you had less race specific error and you had better overall predictive power because it wasn't just that something was weird about the black patients, probably there's just a kind of wear and tear, a kind of like, um, you know, physiologic processes and life course processes that are more common among your black patients, but they exist in other populations too. And I think this has the potential for greater transportability to other settings probably, and improves racial equity in targeting treatment and having patients, having clinicians believe their patients. So I think there's something demoralizing about having pain, about having a problem, having somebody say, well, we did a scan, there's no problem. Um, and so reinforcing the points about sampling, framing research, measure, measuring health status, I think that algorithmic bias, because it comes from more of a um, stats data science framework where they're now applying up to questions that have their own traditions um, is at this point where they need to incorporate things that probably feel more common to us that we think already more about sampling and framing research and measuring health status. But I think these are lessons that are so important that like we can't hear it too much either. Um, and so I'll pause here. So that's kind of the first part of my talk. Um, the second part is thinking about this issue of prediction and causation, but maybe I will pause and see if anybody has questions, because the second part is a little bit more open-ended. Whitney, I wonder, this is Teresa, how widespread do you think this, like, this seems like a major issue and how you're presenting it. And, uh, and I just wondered how prevalent you think it is since a lot of measures have been developed on these tiny populations. And so for population health, this is really a crucial issue. Of it's, I continue to be shocked by how common it is as I go into medicine. I mean, one of the places it comes out, and I'll talk about this, is there are a lot of measures that are developed on a pretty narrow population, they're rolled out. They clearly don't work well in black populations. And instead of going back and making a better tool, 
a lot of times in medicine, they'll add a race correction. And so they do this with lung disease, lung capacity. They do this with kidney cancer, with, sorry, with um, kidney function, which directly influences who's eligible for a new kidney when you have advanced kidney disease. So like you have to be sicker as a black patient to be eligible for a kidney. Um, there's a race correction in C-section tools. There's like all these weird areas of medicine where they're like, eh, this doesn't work well. So let's just add on this weird race correction that often makes it, black patients have to be sicker to get the same treatment. So that's where it's like very explicit. But then there are a lot of other things in medicine where, you know, you don't have to really validate the use of a clinical tool or cut point, like you have to do a drug, people just start using it. And there's no like regulation on the use. Um, people sometimes will do a lot of research before implementing some kind of decision rule in a healthcare system, but often not. And people are just taught this is the way we do it. And they do it. I think that's extremely common in medicine. Um, I had a question so I'm sorry, I'm Solvay. I'm a PhD student in biostat and um, I'm studying algorithmic bias um, awesome. specifically. So you're, it's really cool to hear about it. Um, and I was curious, so my sense of the field is that um, the main uh, avenue that people are pursuing is sort of technological like optimization strategies for like reducing bias. So like you take the same model and you put a penalty on the amount of bias and then you sort of like retrain it um, with the same inputs. And so I guess I was trying to think through like what you're saying. And are you saying that, um, you know, a different approach might be to go back and reconsider like what inputs do you have? What is your target? Like sort of just like reconsider the whole model as the, the solution rather than um, sort of this like optimizing approach because a lot of the literature in this field is in computer science and so they're very interested in these kinds of like optimization problems um but that has always seemed a little like maybe beside the point to me so I was just curious like what you thought about that yeah. and so with the penalty are you saying that they'd have like a priori groups where they're looking to see how well it functions you get a penalty if you don't function well in those subgroups yeah, that's right. So like typically you would be training a model so that it optimized performance, um, but then they just add in another thing, which is like it has to optimize like the, I guess you would say like equality of error rates or something like that across groups. I think it's reasonable and it's kind of an audit, but then if you fail that test, then what happens? And so maybe I'm interested in having enough theory to then think about next steps. And I don't know if that's incorporated already. Yeah, I don't think so. I think typically what it is is like they arrive at a new model that um, optimizes for both performance and this terms of equality. But what you said about the second paper was really interesting because what um, people typically find is that you have to reduce overall performance in order to improve fairness. Um, and that's just like kind of an accepted fact in the computer science literature. So it's like really interesting to see this other example of like if you incorporate more uh, contextual knowledge, then you can improve yeah. both. So and I, yeah. yeah, I think it's a fundamentally different way of seeing it, but it is challenging because people don't want to start over and people don't want to hear like, actually, you don't have the right data <laughs> because that's harder, you know? Um, and so I think one way you could say, well, it's not functioning well in this group. And so they're like, oh, we just bring it down so it just functions badly in everybody, which just seems like not our goal, instead of saying, okay, why is it functioning so badly in this group? And that actually, I think, requires more fundamental causal thinking and maybe saying, maybe I need more data. Maybe I need more representative sample. Maybe I need actually better quality inputs. But knowing what inputs might be missing requires theory, requires understanding like, you know, having hypotheses about the structures that make it perform worse in the group. And it, it, it requires subject matter knowledge. I think, yes, and maybe, yeah, like it would just, I think it requires subject matter knowledge. And I think, yeah, that's really interesting. Thank better, you. I think we can get better performance, but yes, you might have to go back and rethink things, rethink the data you're collecting, how you built the algorithm and what you're trying to optimize for. I saw that you had unmuted, yeah. Hi, Whitney. 
Hi, nice to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, so I think my question is actually after you find issues. So like in the past two years, I found two model, like creative models used very, very ubiquitously in literature. So I know that in the SEAT over my year paper, they went to talk to insurance company or something like that and they fix it. But for someone like me, not significant, <laughs> you know, and all those paper come from like very, very big name, like people yeah. who have like a million of R01. So how do you suggest, what, what do I do? Like, I feel like one, if I say this, yeah. a lot of paper that we have cited on in the past, I don't know, a hundred papers later, you would nullify all of those. So how do someone like me approach it? So are you saying you don't think you could get your critique published or you feel like they would not listen? Would they, like, I think both. Like, in like I mean, you get published, but no one cited. And then two is they would keep doing the same thing because I'm like, doesn't, I'm just like random person, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. I think it's tough. So I was going to talk a little bit about a paper I had done with um, a student. Maybe I'll bring it up. Um, do, do, do. how do I want to do this? Um, I'll stop share. Adjust my screen a little bit. Now I'm pushing the limits of my Zoom facility. Um, I will start another share to look at this paper. Um, is this the right paper? No, this is not the right paper. Uh, maybe it's good enough. Okay, this is good enough. So I actually have done um, a paper with a colleague, Libby McClure, about um, racism. Maybe I'll actually look for it. I'm sorry. I'll give myself 30 more seconds. And if this doesn't work. The COVID paper. Yeah, the COVID paper. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that, but I'll also scroll down to these decks um, while I'm doing this share. Do you all see that? Um, and so hopefully you're seeing this PDF. So the example there was actually about lung function. So during um, Libby McClure's dissertation, she was doing a dissertation on occupational health. And um, there was a factory that they were looking at in North Carolina, a sm aluminum smelting factory. And basically a lot of the, um, the job patterns were very racialized and gendered. You know, there was a certain kind of job that black men were relegated to that was among kind of the worst jobs. Um, black women and white women were kind of put into kind of different jobs. And so she was looking at health as a feature of kind of how people were shuttled into different jobs and some people because of their race and gender were more likely to be in these very dangerous jobs. And as we we're talking, we we're talking to an occupational scientist and he's like, well, how are you going to control for the fact that uh, black people have worse lung function? And this was an idea I had never heard about. Um, and so we started doing some research and it was an idea that um, had been written about a very old idea in the lung function literature. Oh, thank you for the link. Um, the lung function literature um, where measures of lung function have this race correction it was kind of what I talked about. And so what Libby does in the paper, she uses, um, this approach is what she took here. And I'm just giving an example because I think there's no necessarily right answer. Um, but in this paper, what Libby does is um, she looks at these cut points for getting workers' compensation. Um, and she says, you know, you have to, to be a black patient, to be a black worker and get workers' compensation, your lung function has to be worse because of this algorithm. But another thing she found out is that, you know, that same literature that's just based on nationally representative, like in Haynes data says that black uh, people actually have better hearing. There's also workers' compensation for hearing um, and it's not used. There's no race correction there because that race correction would benefit black workers and increase kind of payouts to black workers. Um, and I guess my point is here, 
that, you know, what she did was kind of to at least point out that there are real world consequences. So some of it is saying, whether you think this is right or not, there are these real world consequences. So she anchored to something that depends on this cut point to show that there's real world consequences. I think people have done this with kidney function and um, being eligible to get a new kidney. So that kind of raises the stakes of why this is important potentially if this is a problem. And then she said, you know, but this isn't being applied here. If you say the reasoning is just, well, this needs to be done because, you know, there is this racial difference. Well, then why isn't it also applied here? And so I think one way is to animate people about it by tying it to real world stakes. Another thing is to kind of show an inconsistency to kind of head off the reasoning that, you know, there just are racial differences. There's nothing we can do about it. So that's one kind of approach to take. It's not completely satisfactory. And so I'm really interested in what other people think as well. I don't know if that would help you at all. Oh, I will email you. (laughs) (laughs) I guess if I could just chime in for a second, I would say one thing I would think, Whitney, is that like, well, Bert, you're calling yourself just some random person. I mean, you are a PhD. You are a research scientist. You are a research scientist at the Center for Anti-Racism Research for Health Equity. So you have credentials. So you could write this up and submit it and maybe wouldn't you be your reviewer and hopefully you would get it published. And so you're not just a random person off the street. You have a lot of expertise and you should own that and just have to say that too. And that's true for everybody. Almost everybody on this phone call. (laughs) Also, I think if you're interested in, I think um, a lot of um, op-ed People, I think more people just in the general public are interested in these issues too. So if you want to go that direction, that is a direction to go. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, I could talk about this stuff all day. So um, maybe a little bit about where prediction and causation rub up against each other. Um, and, And so maybe I'll just ask, like, are most people on this call kind of grounded in a more, you know, I'm Epi from UNC, grounded in a very causal potential outcomes framework. We're taking observational data and thinking about it like it's an experiment and then trying to like, you know, design our study to control for all the confounding and get the specific causal effect that you would get if you could run an experiment. That's a little bit of a caricature, but also not that much of a caricature about kind of my training framework and thinking about causal inference. I know that like economists have their own ways and they really put a high priority on causal inference. Some other fields don't. Some other fields also are engaged in trying to understand causal processes, but not in that same framework. And then there's this kind of biostats machine learning framework that says, we're just trying to predict. We're trying to predict, we're trying to target um, and says that all these causal processes don't have much to do with what we're doing. In the commentary that I haven't talked about, um, but that I will show briefly, um, we kind of make the argument that you do need to think about these causal processes with the lung function that we say, if you're just building a model without thinking about the causal processes, you'll say, well, there's differences in lung function by race. Um, Maybe you know that occupational exposures also influence lung function. But if you have a more well-developed causal model of how, you know, work is racialized, then that's going to lead you to think differently about all the confounders you might need, all the factors that might be predictive, where you would normally think, oh, I need to think about poor social and living conditions Um, when I'm thinking about race and occupational exposures, but once you realize that these things are embedded in a nexus of other causal relationships, you realize, oh, maybe race isn't even the thing I want. Maybe I want to do better measurement of occupational exposures, better measurement of social living conditions. Um, And it gives you an idea about what should really be going into your model that I think ultimately will make the model more accurate across groups in general and transportable to different settings. And so that's kind of an argument um, that I'm making in this essay that was published in Biostatistics in 2020. 
And so that, I don't know who asked the question before, I'm not able to see everybody on the screen, but I think it's really relevant um, to what the um, previous questioner from biostatistics was talking about. And so I don't know where people are falling as far as do you think about your work as being very causally oriented or prediction oriented or something totally different. Maybe this prediction versus causation spectrum doesn't even make sense to where you are. Um, and I've just been thinking more about that. I think uh, there are a lot of different perspectives on the call, Whitney. I think that there, there are many different disciplines represented on the call. Um, and even in our population studies and population health training programs, we have differences in the approach to causal inference. And uh, I'm, I'm not, I think fewer of us use this algorithmic approach. Uh, so that may be newer for the large distribution of folks. Although so Sobe, who was talking about that, is uh, you know, studying that in in one in her doctoral in a in a unique interdisciplinary doctoral fellowship that she's doing. Uh, no, I love it. I think that it pushes us to think even more deeply about what we're doing, which is always good. Um, and I have found myself like I'm very grounded in my tradition of causal inference. I love to make a DAG, you know, I'm all about it, but also I think it has a lot of limitations. I think it focuses you on questions in which people are interchangeable and you can hold everything constant except flipping this one thing you might intervene on when that actually is not how people work because people are embedded in social systems that influence multiple domains in their life. And you can't just hold everything constant, but like change this one thing, because what does that even mean? That's not a realistic intervention. Um, and so I kind of straddle these worlds with causal inference, but because I do work in racial equity, I see the limits of the traditional potential outcomes causal inference framework. And so I, I play with it sometimes and break the rules, use it for what I can use it for, but then do things that are very different. And so I always like talking to people about that. And maybe in some of my calls, especially with the trainees, I'm happy to talk about that. I don't know what, a, I mean, you had, we interrupted you partway through your talk and we have until 1.15. Yeah. So you have other slides you want to present and then Not a little bit, and then we can get back to discussion. We'll just wrap up a rent in about 10 minutes. I think I was good on slides. Okay. I am happy to take questions or even end early because I think it's fine to end a talk early if nobody has questions. <laughs> All right, good. Let's open it up to the group. And uh, you've given us so much to think about. I want to sit with the silence. If nobody have other questions, can I ask another? Sure, Bert. <laughs> Go ahead. So, so you mentioned like the disconnect or like conflict between theory driven and the way like epidemiology or medicine does work. So like one example is like if you study uh, the relationship between structural racism and health inequity, a lot of our work like is driven by the fundamental cause. Yes. And like in my work, we would use, uh, we would like do model that just link structural racism and health outcome with, without it, adjusting for any confounder, basically proximal causes. And uh, like, that's how I work. But a lot of time I got pushback yes. from like traditional tra <laughs> trainer of a traditional method that like, you have to throw all this in. Unless like a lot of people think that you didn't adjust enough. So I guess like, I wanna hear what you think about like which approach like, I mean, like, what do you take, which approach do you take or how population health scientists should like do, I guess. So sometimes I take the path, path of least resistance and I'm like, I just want to get this published, like fine. Just being real. Um, and sometimes, I mean, I think the disconnect is just that people are asking fundamentally different questions. And like the question you are trying to ask and answer is just not the question they are trying to ask and answer because they are thinking about still in this framework of, you know, I can really isolate this like one thing and then I have this like clean effect, even though you're like, that's not reasonable because you're just extrapolating over empty space because they're 
are no people when you're holding all this stuff constant. There are really no people there. So, I mean, that's one thing. This literature from Epi, there's a term called structural confounding. Um, and there's some great work. Lynn Messer is one of the authors and she was looking at birth outcomes. And, and Susan Mason. And Susan Mason. Are you here, Susan? Yes. So that's beautiful work. And so some of it is just, I don't know how deep you want to go, but that approach also has all these limitations, even just from a purely statistical properties point of view, where you have all these positivity issues and you're extrapolating over empty space. And it's not even reasonable what what you're asking. An approach I actually take a lot is a design approach. Um, A lot of my work is I do weird study designs, honestly. Like I cut the data in weird ways instead of trying to use covariate adjustment or analytic approaches to get to the answer I want, I I, I try to use weird designs. So I'll give some examples. Um, So like for my dissertation work, I used ad health. Everybody uses ad health, it's very common. Um, And it was about obesity and gender and race. So almost all the work, you know, would either adjust for race or gender or like compare obesity in white girls and black girls, um, because that's where you saw the biggest gap. Um, and so in my work, I'm like, why are we always comparing the white girls and the black girls, even though we know that like their social environments on the margin are totally different. Like the neighborhoods are different. The schools are different. Like you're not going to be able to control all that away. So I think one thing is I often think we're not going to be able to control all of it away. So even the people who are like at all these things, even if you buy into their framework, it's insufficient because you can't control all of that away. And so I said, why don't we instead compare the black girls and the black boys? Because they were young and on the margin, they're coming from similar families they're coming from similar neighborhoods. And it kind of flips the question. And then that issue of all the confounding control isn't there. And it's just sometimes I'll just kind of flip the question to get at a question where I actually think the confounding control issues are simpler and it's it's a different frame. So then I was really asking questions more about gender than about racial difference, because I thought, Everybody's doing it, but there's no there, there. It's not getting us anywhere. Um, Another study I worked on was the EDIC study. And I'll put that name in the chat. Tom Leviste was a PI. And what Tom Leviste did is he said, all these studies do white black comparisons, you know, but again, you have all this residual confounding. And he's like, I'm going to try to pick census blocks where you have whites and blacks who are living in the same census blocks, similar level of education, similar level of income, you know, on a pretty consistent basis, not just gentrification, but kind of longstanding, like lack of inequity in these populations. It was less than 1% of the country, but he found a few census tracts like this. And he's like, let's look at these census tracts and then look at racial difference. And in those census tracts, a lot of the racial difference didn't exist. So that's, again, a different question because it's kind of really nailing down this idea that kind of this genetic determinism is kind of a lie once you use study design to get at places where there's more equity. And like, I have a study now that's doing something weird. So very long-winded, but one approach I use is kind of study reframe and kind of like a, a weird approach to what contrast I'm doing, what population I'm doing. And I use weird study designs. I had a quick question. Um, so one thing that I ruminate a lot about seeing these black white differences where we have these um, God racist notions about lung function, for example, or about the pain, like all these racist notions built into our um, algorithms and built into the ep- I was just at the doctor this morning, that epic system, you know, I'm sure it's spitting out different things based on, you know, what people are saying. Has anybody gone in? Um, so and then I think about our population health data where we don't do these corrections, you know, where we don't apply these kinds of things to it. Has anybody gone in and taken like all of that administrative data that like Epic or these companies have on people and then redone it all to tell all the doctors you're wrong and you're race basing this? Like, has that happened yet? Like, are we at this point now where we're redoing that? Does that make sense? I don't know if that makes sense, but like, don't we have the data to correct all of these racist assumptions? And is anybody doing that yet? Or are we not there yet? There's big conversations in medicine now. Like, so I think the the things where you have explicit race corrections are kind of like the tip of the iceberg. And I think people see that. And there's been a lot of movement literally in the past two years about that. And I think some places have actually like changed that. But I think they're not sure about like where to go next. And so that kind of gets back to that question before, like you realize, oh, there's this inequity. 
And, uh, you know, medicine is weird because they're like, we just want a tool, <laughs> you know, like we just we just need something. We are practicing today on patients. We want something. Um, and so I think there's a lot of flux there. I think that there's a realization that, oh, what we're doing is not great. I think there's still a lot of, I'm going to say opportunity to <laughs> build new frameworks that do better. But I think there is kind of like, we're in a place where there are some people who are like, okay, this isn't really working, but I think there is a gap. And I mean, I haven't gotten too deep into this, but the the selling of health data to private companies that then make proprietary tools is very disturbing to me. I don't know much about it, but I think that's much more widespread than I imagined. And so there are vested interests that have a lot of money in kind of keeping the data, not sharing it, and also um, maintaining the status quo or uh, keeping control. So I think that's like a larger meta issue about health data in the US that it's like so tied up in money, just even the data. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Thank you, Whitney. Welcome. All right, we have a couple minutes left. Who else has a question? I've stunned them. I appreciate everybody for coming out. Yes. I want to thank you, Whitney, so much. Your round of applause, everybody, for a wonderful talk. So stimulating and big picture. And I think your unique contributions to this field, like our and to this conversation, have only come because you are conversant across these different fields. So again. Population health. <laughs> well, thank you. I'll be seeing some of you later in the day and I look forward to it. Great. All right. Thanks everyone. Bye.